Loading Church family, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, and I'm going to read the account of the Apostle Paul's ministry to the city of Philippi on his second missionary journey. And so we're going to read verses 11 through 40, and then we're going to turn to the book of Philippians, the letter that he wrote to that town, that church that he founded there. But first, let's read in Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 11. It says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Who's us? Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men who serve, these men, excuse me, are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the prison, uh, into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners has, had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to you, have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they put us out secretly. No, indeed, let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Just so far, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, if you would turn to the little book of Philippians, Philippians, and I want to read chapter 4 and verse 8, a verse I believe is probably familiar to many of you. And we'll read verses 8 and 9. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, 
and the God of peace will be with you. Paul was on his second missionary journey when he went to the city of Philippi. Then, some time later, Paul wrote a letter to the church at Philippi. And here in this particular verse, he instructs them on what to think. Now, some take issue that there are certain forms of education that only teach people what to think and doesn't teach them how to think. But I submit to you that education involves both. And so does an education in the Christian life. We must know what to think and how to think. Uh, This message is focused this morning primarily on Paul's words to the church at Philippi to meditate or think on these things. That's the title of the message, Think on These Things. What are these things we are to think on? And how will our lives be impacted by such thinking? Well, let's first of all state this at the outset. Ideas have consequences. Ideas have consequences. And someone said, bad ideas have victims. Francis Schaeffer said, the inner thought world determines the outer actions. You are what you think. You do not do anything that you have not first thought about. Everything begins in the mind. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The Bible commands Christians to be holy because the God who saved us from our sins and saved us to himself is holy. And holiness must characterize our conduct. And that means holiness must be in our mind. Consider this. What led the Apostle Paul to go to the city of Philippi in the first place? The immediate circumstances in Acts chapter 16 were that God's Spirit did not permit them to continue in Asia and instead led him through a vision to go to Macedonia, which is a region of Greece where the city of Philippi was located. So Philippi marks the first city or the the first church in Europe during what we call Paul's second journey, missionary journey. So Paul's mindset was to do what the Spirit of God was leading him to do. But let's back up for a minute and ask this. Why was Paul so concerned to take the gospel to the world? And let's go back further still and ask, what made a person who hated Jesus become so compelled to live for Jesus and tell others about him? The answer is that Paul's life was changed by the power of God through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went from persecuting the church to being a servant of Christ for the church, which Jesus purchased with his own blood. Paul's life changed. His thinking changed. His actions, his will, his goals. It all changed. What became evident in his travels was a radical transformation in his mind. His heart And mind changed, and so therefore did his life. Ideas have consequences. Again, as Schaefer said, your inner thought world, your inner thought world determines the outer actions. Maybe this is a time to just pause for a minute and ask, has Christ changed your life? Have you been changed by Christ? How are you different? What has changed? Is it merely an outward and external change? Or has the inner life been changed? Your thoughts, your mind. When Christ changes someone, he makes them a new creation. An inward transformation takes place. All of us are thinking about something all the time. (laughs) No matter how often your mind goes blank, something fills the void. Believers are to have our minds in a continual process of renewal, always challenged and changed by the Word of God, always influenced, convicted, and convinced, taught, and rebuked by the Bible. And these days of physical distancing and schedule shattering and nowhere near normalcy have given us much time to think, to be alone with our thoughts, to wrestle through fear or anger, isolation, Impatience, frustration, concern, differences of opinion, and the varying ways that we hear the facts being interpreted. Let's consider this morning Paul's command to meditate on or think on these things. That 
word in Philippians 4, 8 is a command. It's not a suggestion. Meditate on these things. A Christian must choose to think on certain things. What things? What's a Christian person to think? Well, notice these words that he spells out here. And I believe there are six of them. And then, the, then some people say that there are eight of them. I think the last two sort of characterize all of them, right? So let's look at, first of all, whatever things are true. That's what he says there in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Uh, to, to think on what is true is to think on what is valid and reliable and honest. Uh, to think, that is, on whatever is true in character in the, in the widest sense. It's the opposite of thinking on falsehood. I want you to note that we are not to think on the word true, or as we read this, the words uh, noble or the word just or the word pure. This, along with the, this word along with the others in this list provide us with categories for thought. Think on things which are qualified by each of these and understand that what is pure is also noble and just and what is true is also lovely and of good report. True things will be true in the end. All false things will be unmasked in the end, and those will go down in dismay who cling to them. God does care what we believe, see, and how we act. It's a destructive lie to believe otherwise. So are you choosing to believe things which are true, or are you choosing to believe things which are not true? We spent time over the last six weeks in different portions of Scripture examining and soaking our minds in the greatness and majesty of God. Isn't it wonderful to just read passages of Scripture like Job 38, 39, and 40, and Isaiah chapter 40, or any of the accounts of the resurrection of Christ? You must fill your mind with the truth of the glorious excellencies of the Holy Creator and of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. The, the moral standards of Christianity, those standards that God is calling us to, depend on great realities. Think on whatever things are true. Secondly, he says, think on whatever things are noble. To think on things that are noble are to think on things that are worthy of respect, that are honorable. Think on things that produce a noble seriousness. That is, things that are morally attractive. The, the opposite is to think on things that are worthy of scorn. What are you giving your thoughts to in these days? In our society, people will do anything for a laugh, no matter how irreverent. There are some people who appreciate a good joke, but there are some who don't know how to do anything but joke. There's no seriousness about them. Calvin said, keep a distance from all profane filthiness. Think on things that are true and noble. And then he says, think on things, whatever things are just. That's to think on what is right or righteous. Think on things that are upright, that conform to God's standards and thus are worthy of his approval. Think in harmony with God's divine standard of holiness. Jesus asked the multitudes in Luke chapter 12 and verse 57, why do you not judge what is right? Simply, he's saying, why don't you just do what is acceptable to God? And the thought with, it, it began with their mind. He says, why don't you judge us? Why don't you discern what is right? Do you remember that Cain was told by God to choose to do what is right? He said to, to do what is well, and it, it will be accepted. Your, your sacrifice will be accepted if you choose to do right. But Cain allowed his anger to master his thoughts, and he chose to do evil, and he murdered his brother. But the, the text indicates that all that began in his mind. It didn't begin with an action. According to Proverbs 6, God hates certain things, including a lying tongue, a proud look, and one who sows discord among the brethren. God hates these things. It's the word of doing what's right is the word that's used in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, listen to this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's right to obey your parents. God wants you to do that. Whatever things are just, he says, think on these things. And then whatever things are pure. Whatever things are pure. True, noble, just, and pure. Think on things that are morally pure. That is, without moral defect, that are innocent, that are harmless. Are, are you under the misconception that the Bible is irrelevant? Then hear this call to think on whatever things are pure. Think for a moment about what good comes from pure thoughts and what evil comes from impure thoughts. 
Is it fair that people are swindled out of their money because someone schemed a way to scam them? That's not right, is it? Are impure and lustful thoughts good for the soul? Of course not. Originally, this word meant what awakens all, something that awakens all. There's truly something awe-inspiring about purity and innocence. Jesus was and is without any speck of impurity. He is completely pure, untainted in character. And the scriptures say the word of God is pure. It's perfect. And don't we look at the word of God with amazement and awe? Don't we look at the Lord Jesus Christ with such amazement at his character, at his purity? Brothers and sisters, think on whatever things are pure and think on whatever things are lovely. Whatever things are lovely. To think on things that are lovely means think on that which is pleasing, things that are agreeable and amiable. You know, the Bible says that Esther, Queen Esther, was beautiful and lovely. So lovely is something beyond outward appearance. One commentator says this word speaks of that which is adapted to excite love and to endear him who does such things. Matthew Henry said, everything in Christ is amiable. He is chief among 10,000. He is altogether lovely. Believers are to focus on whatever is lovely, that is, whatever is kind and gracious. And then he says, think on things that are of good report. Whatever things are of good report. That is to think on that which is fair sounding and attractive and rings true to the highest standards. It is a command to think on that which is praiseworthy and commendable. And then he gives a summary phrase. Not only does he list these six words of whatever is true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good report. Then he says, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, if there's anything any virtue and anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think on things that are excellent. Th- th- this, this word for virtue, it's the most comprehensive Greek term for moral excellence. Paul, or excuse me, Peter says, we have been redeemed in order that we might proclaim the praises, that is the excellencies, of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You will only be able to proclaim his excellencies with your mouth if you first know them in your heart and mind. Paul says to think on anything which calls down the approval of God. Think on that which deserves praise. Who or what do you praise? Take a moment to think about that. Isn't it true that what you most value is reflected in what you think about most often? which often comes out in your conversation, doesn't it? That's why Jesus said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, because those things proceed from the heart, or from the heart, the mind. He's talking about the inner person. One commentator, Hendrickson, says, Hendrickson, excuse me, says, these things Paul tells the church to meditate on, summarize, these things summarize anything at all that is a matter of moral and spiritual excellence so that it is the proper object of praise, is the right pasture for the Christian mind to graze in. I like that. Picture your mind grazing like a, like a cow. He says, your mind is grazing. Pick the right pasture to graze in. There are things that are worthy of the Christian to think on, and there are things that are unworthy. The list of things helps us, this list helps us to automatically identify not only those things that are worthy, but what are unworthy of our meditation. What does Paul say to do with all of these things, these objects that classify as these things? He says, meditate on them. That means to consider them, to reckon them, to take them into account. It means to contemplate, to carefully reflect on these things, and they will shape your conduct. Jerry Bridges says, we must decide what will be our biggest influence, society, that is sinful society, or the Word of God. We must give ourselves continually to the Word and be molded by it, and not by the world. Give ourselves to the Word, be molded by it, and not by the world. He says, we should not think of the concept of continually as meaning every moment. Rather, we should think of terms of of consistency and 
habitually, consistently think on the Word of God. Habitually think on the Word of God. What does your mind turn to when it's free to turn to anything? Bridges says, um, he asked, do you begin to meditate on Scripture? He says, I, I often ask this question. When you can think about anything you want to think about, what do you think about? Do you think about your problems? Or do you engage in mental arguing with someone else? Do you ever find yourself having an argument and no one's around, but that person's in your mind and you're having an argument with them? You rehearse your problems or perhaps even allow your mind to drift into the wasteland of impure thoughts. Thinking is our most constant activity. Our thoughts are our constant occupation. We are never without them, but we can choose the direction and the content of those thoughts. Paul says something amazing in verse 9. He says, These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do. And the God of peace will be with you. He says, These things that you, notice this, you learned and received and heard and saw in me. In other words, if, if you're wondering, how do I put these things into practice that are there in verse 8? What does it mean to think on these things? There's a life that exemplifies this. Of course, the life of Christ exemplifies this. But Paul says, these are things you learned and received and heard and saw in me. Now, when Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi, he's in prison. So when and where did they see these things in him? Well, when he was with them in their own town of Philippi, of course. We read about that in Acts chapter 16. That's the real life experience of someone who meditated on that which is true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Paul gave his thoughts to what is virtuous and praiseworthy. So let's take time here to notice from that passage in Acts, and I'm just going to refer to that in Acts chapter 16, Let's take time to see what thinking on these things looked like in Paul's life, even while he was in Philippi. Because if he says, you can imitate these things that you saw and learned and heard in me, then we must have examples for us. And I think we do, certainly in Acts 16, of what that looked like. So there are several things. This is how we want to close the message out here. We want to list a half a dozen things that demonstrate to us what does it mean to have this mind? What will it look like to have this mindset? Number one, we noticed that when Paul was in Philippi, he prioritized prayer. Did you notice that? He prioritized prayer. It says that Paul and his traveling companions went down to the, the riverside where some ladies regularly met. So he, which included himself and his group, Silas and Luke and Timothy, that band of preachers there, missionaries, went and met them there. Because Paul's mind had been captivated by Jesus, you know what he did? He prioritized what Jesus prioritized, and that is prayer. He knew God answers prayer. How do you respond to prayer times? Are you uplifted by the reality that God answers prayer? We must seek an audience with the king. He inclines his ear to the humble. You know, you will probably not have an appetite for prayer if the blessings of prayer are not in your mind. If the priority of prayer is not something that you have your mind set on, then you won't find yourself talking to the Lord throughout the day or gathering together with some believers. And hopefully soon we can gather together with a larger group of believers. Paul had the mindset that prioritized prayer. Secondly, Paul was burdened for the lost. We see that, don't we? There are several wonderful stories of conversion in Acts chapter 16. So Paul knew that this time of prayer was an opportunity not only to go down with the ladies and pray with them, but it was an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. So he and his travel companions met the people who were there. They explained the good news of Jesus to them. And again, because Paul's mind had been captivated by Jesus, he prioritized what Jesus prioritized, which is not only prayer, but also evangelism and discipleship. He knew God answers prayer, and he knew that God works through the proclamation of the gospel. The, the precious truth that Christ has come to save the lost, that his gospel rescues people from damnation, these truths were ingrained in Paul and his cohorts. The eternal realities of heaven and hell were impressed on their minds. Are they impressed on yours? 
There is a war out for the souls of men and women and children. The callousness of unbelieving hearts and the busy work of Satan to further harden those hearts makes it imperative for us to be immersed in the things of God to engage in such a battle. I submit to you that if you don't set your mind on things above, you will have no power, no courage to witness and may in fact find yourself unmoved by the fate of your neighbors, co-workers or family members who are on their way to hell. Paul was burdened for the lost. Thirdly, he knew that God does the impossible. His burden for the lost sent him on a mission to do what is humanly impossible, to see people come to the saving knowledge of Christ, to see people who were dead in their sins become alive by the power of God. He knew that God does the impossible. Philippi was a a Roman outpost. It's a pagan city there. there. There's no Christians there on Paul's arrival. They don't meet him and say and greet him and say, Paul, we're so glad you've come. We've heard all about your testimony. We know what you're doing. Come on in. There's also not many Jews there. You know, Paul made it a custom when he went to places. He would often go to the synagogue. He would sit down. He would reason with them from the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. But there apparently is not a synagogue there because there's no mention of him going into one as he normally would. That leads us to believe there are not many Jews there because the synagogue takes 10 Jewish men who are heads of households to form a synagogue. Only 10. So maybe if you're with Paul, you might be thinking, how can God work in this place that is opposed to the exclusivity of Christ? They've got their own gods. They've got their own way of worship. Have you ever thought something like that? How's God going to save anyone around here? You know where you don't get that thought? You don't get that thought from meditating on the truth. Paul knew God can and does save lost people. And guess what? There are these several conversion stories in Philippi. And look at them. There's a wealthy businesswoman in Lydia, a demon-possessed slave girl, and a jailer. Wow. We think, how will these people ever change? There's no hope, but God did it. You think Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke were fired up to go to the next town after that and pray and preach the gospel? I do. You know, you don't build that confidence in the gospel if your mind is not captivated by Christ. If I give myself to thinking more and more about having fun, about entertaining myself and making sure I'm never bored, I will not redeem the time for God's glory. The result is a lack of belief And God holds me accountable for that. We allow ourselves to worry because we doubt God's goodness. We doubt his ability to to help us. I I allow the worried voice in my mind to run the show and to call the shots. I, I listen to myself instead of speaking the truth to myself. And that's dangerous because it's fostering a lack of trust in God. What will you trust and who will you trust if you don't trust him? The list of possibilities is endless and it's deadly. If you don't believe that God does the impossible, you will begin to put your confidence in many other things, including yourself, your own means, your own resources. Paul's mindset was God does the impossible. And also notice the apostle Paul had a discerning spirit. He had a discerning spirit. That's the fourth thing. The demon-possessed girl spoke, but she spoke truth only as a distraction. It's a strange thing. She's talking about these are servants of the Most High. But she was still fortune-telling. How did Paul know what was going on here? His mind was filled with the truth of God. And so he cast this unclean spirit out of her. I submit to you that you will only battle the enemy peddlers of false gospels, the cults, and heretics if you know the truth. You can't tell what a forfeit looks like if you don't know the real thing. If you follow after your lusts because you think you'll miss out on something by staying pure, you will lack any true satisfaction in God and in the object of your lust. Being preoccupied with what is noble and pure and praiseworthy, however, will aid you in developing a discerning spirit. He had a discerning spirit. Fifthly, he was strengthened 
during great hardship. Paul was strengthened during great hardship. Who doesn't read the story of Paul and Silas in jail, okay, after being beaten with rods, fastened in stocks, and put into the inner prison, sort of like the maximum security of his day, all of that for preaching the gospel. And then, after all of that, they are praying and singing hymns to God at midnight. Who doesn't read that story and get fired up? Oh, this is incredible. There's this sense of awe and wonder, right? And then there's also this sense of, man, I could never do that. That's the kind of attitude we have, right? They went through all of this without one complaint. We don't find them worrying or doubting God, nor his power or goodness. It's after the fact that they bring up that, you know, you did this without a trial for Roman citizens. They don't say this until after they, their ordeal and after they're singing in jail and praying at midnight. They are interested in things other than getting in the last word. How often does your mind go to how you're going to fix this by getting in the last word? Not to mention, they don't say anything about a lawsuit. They're not trying to bring charges. They were loving God in troubled waters. The disciples did not leave us a manual for how to break out of prison. They left us with a guide for how to get through it with love in our hearts for God and the best interest of even our persecutors in mind. Paul made sure the Philippian jailer knew that there was hope for him, even him. He made sure that the man who was in some part responsible for his pain did no pain to himself. How could Paul act like that? How could he have such concern? He had to think that way first, didn't he? He had to have the mindset that I deserve hell, but Christ saved me in order for him to treat another man who's unworthy of God's grace with the kind of kindness and mercy and truth that he was treated with from Christ himself. Again, is it any surprise that if your thoughts are mostly about your own well-being, about your own comfort, about your own ease, is it any surprise that any disturbance of those thoughts is going to be met with great resistance? My pride can't deal with letting others off when my feelings get hurt. I think they're getting away with something and my pride can't deal with that. I allow myself to resent them. In that moment, I have no appreciation for the forgiveness of sins that's found in Christ. When my comfort and my peace is disturbed, at that moment, I have no appreciation for Christ emptying himself and Christ laying aside the obvious display of his glory, becoming, becoming poor for my sake, for your sake. I have... No sense, no appreciation for that. I, I, become, I become preoccupied with how my peace has been distracted when my thoughts are all about myself. That's why it's so important to set your mind on things that are true and right and noble and pure and just and lovely. Be very careful. I submit to you that these things can so occupy your heart, these false thoughts they can so occupy your heart that before you know it, you'll be staring in shock at your own Christless thoughts and wondering, how did I ever get here? Meditate on what is praiseworthy. You know what that does? It'll deal a, it'll, it'll deal a death blow to your pride. It'll allow you to, to sooner forgive those who offend you. Meditate on what is true and noble and you will be able to get through trying and difficult times. Sixthly, the Apostle Paul encouraged brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what he did when this was all over? There's one verse, chapter, four, or chapter 16 of Acts and verse 40. Paul gets out of prison, and what do they do? Him and Silas, they go to Lydia's house, and he does what? Does he complain there about the local magistrates? No. Does he feel sorry for himself for all that's happened? No. Does he talk doubtfully about whether God is still in control or not? Of course not. He is mindful of others. So he takes the time, he takes the opportunity before he leaves town to encourage his brothers and sisters in Christ. He encouraged the brethren. What a wonderful phrase. 
Remember who originally read this letter to the Philippian church? The people who originally read this letter, that is those who were at the church at Philippi, they were people like Lydia and her household. The demon-possessed former, one-time demon-possessed slave girl. The jailer and his household. They all witnessed these things in Paul. They're reading this letter. And now, in Paul's letter, he tells them to do those things that they saw in him that they learned and received and heard from him. They are called to think on, to meditate on these things, and so are you and I. Here's what we all know. We're always thinking. Our thoughts, our ideas, they have consequences. These days have perhaps provided many of us with much more time on our hands to do a lot more thinking than we've ever done. How are you doing with that? What are you filling your mind with? Let me remind you what Paul tells us. Meditate on those things which are true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Meditate on what is virtuous and praiseworthy. You know what happens when you do? Your thoughts are well-pleasing to the Lord and godly actions flow out of godly thoughts. Look at what else happens. Paul says in verse 9, When you do these things that you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do and the peace, excuse me, the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. Peace is highly underrated, isn't it? Yet God, the God of peace, promises his children, promises them his blessed presence with those who fill their minds with his truth. You say, well, he's always with his children, isn't he? Yes, but why don't you always experience that peace? I submit to you it's because your mind is far from him. Meditate on these things, and the God of peace will work in you, will work so that you, like the Apostle Paul, You will prioritize prayer. You will have a burden for the lost. You will believe God to do the impossible. You will exercise spiritual discernment. You will have strength during hardship. You will make time to encourage brothers and sisters in Christ. All of those things begin with having a mind that is renewed by Christ and his word. Think on these things. Let's pray. Now, Father, we pray that the mind of Christ, our Savior, would be in us today and that we would cultivate the mind that you've called us to have. We thank you for grace and mercy that even allows us to know and to think and to do what is pleasing to you. Now, may your spirit enable us and empower us today to do those things in Jesus' name. Amen.